our second speaker is S. Ramakrishnan. He is a polymer chemist. He works at the Department of uh, Inorganic and Physical Chemistry at the Indian Institute of Science, IIC in Bangalore. He has a very strong Chennai connection. He did his early schooling in Chennai and after his uh, undergrad education in uh, um, then it was Bombay, Mumbai now. Uh, he went abroad, did his PhD at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He's been at IIC for several years now. His research focuses on uh, developing strategies to control properties of polymers and to design and study new uh, polymers using novel molecular techniques. He received the Shanti Swaroop Bhatnagar Award in the year 2005 for chemical sciences. He is a fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences. And today he is here to tell us about a material which given our modern urban lifestyle is ubiquitous all around us, plastics. Good afternoon, Chennaiites. It's a real pleasure for me to be here. You know, I, I, when I got this invitation, I, I was uh, hoping to be at the Sabha because unlike the previous speaker who's a qualified uh, violinist, I have no such uh, skills that would have taken me to the stage at the Music Academy. So, but this is a wonderful audience, a wonderful location too, and the appetite for science in Chennai is evident from the number of, stu number of uh, people here in the auditorium today. Uh, you know, I, I, I work on polymers, and this is, what I'm going to talk about is not what I really research on, but it's something that concerns all of us, and this is something that uh, people, when I go out and say I'm a polymer chemist, a lot of questions get thrown to me about the context in which uh, plastics are being used today, and whether it's good, bad, or ugly. And what I would say is, it is all three of them, and I'll try and tell you what is good about it, <clears throat> what is bad about it, and the ugly, obviously, you know. <clears throat> so when I sort of tell the word plastics and ask you to imagine what you see or what comes to your mind, there are two possible images that might come. One is this, and the other is this. Okay, and I suspect that majority of you in the audience would actually pick the right image uh, as the image that comes to your mind first when you actually think of plastics. It's not the image on the left, although the image on the left is probably something that you take for granted. Okay, it's relevance in daily life and it's relevance in medicine. But it is the eyesore on the right that actually sticks to our mind, you know, largely because uh, that is something that we are extremely worried about. So now, before I go into the talk, I, so I think an important question that comes to our mind is, who do you think is responsible for this? You know, is it the plastic that is responsible? Or do you think uh, because of this image, uh, just as many sort of, uh, we have many uh, uh, requests to do the following. That is, because of the above, do you think we should ban plastics altogether? And there is a chorus of voices that is coming out that appears to suggest that we should ban plastics altogether. It is like asking the question, uh, since there are so many car accidents, should we ban driving cars altogether? I mean, the answer to most of you is evident that we shouldn't. So the same is true for plastics, and the context in which we should view this is exactly the way that I pose the second question. So here is an example of uh, plastics that we use a lot. Okay, let me see if I can. I have listed out a variety of plastics here, and uh, okay, anyway, I have the mouse, but I was trying to get the uh, laser pointer. So there are many types of plastics that we use regularly. On the bottom, you see stuff which is called polypropylene, polyethylene, and there are two types of polyethylene, PVC, uh, polyethylene terthalate, which is PET, which is the bottled water that we buy often, and polystyrene in the middle which is largely the sort of items that we use for food. Okay, and on the bottom you see uh, something that shows you the, uh, the characters. There's a certain label that goes into these plastics. Many of you may not have paid attention to it. These are there in all items that we use. 
one is PET, two HDPE, and so on. Okay, these are these are labels that allow you to identify what type of plastic. And why is it important to identify the type of plastic? Because a lot of plastics, uh, because they're very large uh, molecules, they actually don't mix. Okay, and I'll come to that in a second. Maybe I'm jumping the gun. So now. I want to spend a few minutes on this very interesting topic, especially because I saw these lovely posters on the outside about climate. So there is a very strong interconnectedness between various issues that are facing us today. Okay, for instance, I have four uh, quadrants here and four issues that I've listed. One is the resource. Okay, that is everything we need, food, clothing, housing, transportation, healthcare, and conveniences like the cell phone, laptop, headphones, and all these. All of these uh, depend on our extracting resources from the earth. And resources from the earth are limited. And so one point that we need to be concerned about is the sustainability of the resource that we are utilizing for everything that we make. So everything that we need utilizes resources. OK, these are just photographs of the various kinds of things that we have food, medical, healthcare, transportation, clothing, and so on. Everything we discard, okay, leftovers, used items, exhaust from transportation, medical waste, etc., are what we create waste out of. And these are actually categorized as pollution, something that we discard after using, or leftovers after we use. Everything we need to make okay, requires energy. So nothing on the extreme right that you see comes without utilizing energy. Okay, so everything that we require requires energy, and energy is something that we create artificially, right? So most of the energy that we use today is created artificially. And it is created largely, as of today, 75% of the energy that we utilize is created from fossil fuel. And as all of you know, fossil fuel is something when you burn, you generate carbon dioxide, which is one of the culprits in, in the changing climate that they are facing today. So in other words, artificial energy, that generation, leads to climate change. And so climate change impacts the resources that we have. For instance, if we have uh, uh, arid areas in our, uh, in our uh, country, you will impact food production. Okay, likewise, if you have uh, lots of forest fires, you will impact the ability of carbon dioxide to be sequestered by natural uh, uh, elements on the earth. So in some sense, all these issues are interconnected. And I might add that if you want to deal with waste that we are generating, that is pollution that we are creating, every method that you would design to, uh, to, uh, to handle the pollution that you are generating would require energy to do so. Okay, so every aspect is interconnected. That means if you have waste that you want to recycle, for instance, you need to input energy. And so the energy needs to be generated. And if you generate energy, you will generate uh, carbon dioxide as of today. So one of the key issues that is facing us in the context of uh, pollution and sustainability is actually the energy itself. That is, we need to develop alternate sources of energy that will ensure it is non-polluting. So once we disconnect the link between generation of energy and climate change, we will cut this cycle and we'll be in a position to handle many of the problems that we are faced with uh, uh, very easily. Okay, so this is just to present a context of, of the talk today uh, to sort of import, to highlight the interconnectedness of various issues that we are faced with today. So that, with that, let me go to this question again. That is, uh, what are really plastics made of? So I'm going to give a very small primer, because it's a general lecture, on what plastics are made of. So plastics is a very generic term that uh, uh, sort of clumps a large, large number of various kinds of systems together. Okay, we're all familiar with molecules, especially the small ones, like water and carbon dioxide. These are very small, I say they're 18 and 44 is the molecular weight. That means they're very small molecules. And of course, all of us hear about cholesterol, which is another molecule. 
which has a molecular weight about 386 Dalton. Small molecules in general uh, have molecular weights of the order of 500 or less Daltons. Okay, so that's generally the molecular weights of small molecules. On the other hand, polymers are very large macromolecules. For instance, polyethylene is a string of carbon atoms. Okay, that's what I've shown you there. A string of carbon atoms with a molecular weight of a million. Okay, that means it's significantly larger than the very small molecules that we usually deal with. That is one of the most important polymers that we use a lot. Second is polypropylene that has a similar molecular weight. And of course, the only difference between ethylene and propylene is the presence of a, a small unit which we call a methyl, that is a CH3 unit on every alternate carbon. Together, just these two polymers form almost 50% of the total plastics that we manufacture. Okay, just these two classes of polymers, polyethylene and polypropylene. And what you need to remember is this is a polymer that is, has only carbon atoms in the backbone. Okay, and it's a unique class because it is something that uh, living systems do not know how to digest or do not know how to degrade. Okay, whenever there is uh, uh, polymer chains that are built of only carbon atoms, that's a problem. Polyethylene terephthalate, on the other hand, PET, which is the bottle that I just drank water out of, has an interesting unit in the backbone, and that is this that I've highlighted here. This is called an ester unit. That means it has an oxygen atom. This red is an oxygen atom that is there in the backbone, okay? And an ester is something that we have in our body, and a lot of enzymes know how to handle it. There are enzymes called esterases. Likewise, there are aminases and so on, which can break bonds between carbon oxygen. It can break bonds between carbon and nitrogen. But we don't have enzymes that can break bonds between carbon and carbon, okay? So that's the difference between the top two polymers and the bottom one. So in other words, if there are heteroatoms, anything outside of carbon is usually referred to as a heteroatom like carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, etc. If these atoms are present in the backbone, then the potential for being able to degrade it in, in the biosystem is far better than if it is built of just hydrocarbons as the top two. So an important question that arises is, what is it that makes plastic such an attractive material, okay, compared to a lot of other materials? <clears throat> there are several things. One of the important aspects of polymers is that it is a molecular material, and it has several unique properties that I've listed here. One is it's lightweight, high strength, and easily processable. Elasticity is a unique characteristic of polymeric materials. I'll tell you a little more about it. Viscoelasticity is another very unique property of polymer materials. That means it can both behave as a viscous liquid and as an elastic solid at the same time, depending on the time scale of the measurement. Adhesive property is another subset of viscoelasticity. And of course, the most important aspect is it can generate gels, which is a highly cross-linked network that can hold a lot, large amount of solvent, like water. Okay, and it's very interesting to think about ourselves, all living systems, but for the inorganic framework that I have in my body, which is the bone, I would collapse like a starfish. And what I'm really made out of is a gel, is a hydrogel. We, in our human body, carry a large number of very large macromolecules, like the synthetic ones that we make. And this actually is the essence of living system. So it's very interesting that nature has chosen much of the functions to perform and handed it over to very large macromolecules. That's a topic for a different discussion, but it's very interesting that all the functions like enzymatic catalysis, et cetera, are handled, and also information storage, like in DNA, is handled by very large macromolecules like the ones that we deal with, and not by small ones. Okay, so what, what is unique about a molecular material? A lot of materials that we know are, for instance, metals. Okay, metals are built up of constituent atoms. There are no molecules in metals. Okay, me metals... At metallic atoms are held together by what we call metallic bonds. Likewise, ceramic, like glass, for instance, is an extended solid. In other words, all the atoms in glass are actually connected to every other atom through a network. Okay, and so there is no independent molecular translation or mobility in these systems. Unlike in polymers, polymers are built up of a large number of macromolecules. For instance, this material is a collection of large number of polyethylene terephthalate molecules 
all sitting together to form a material. And why is that important? It is important because the, the, uh, the, the flexibility of molecules impacts the properties. And I'll give you one example. So this is just a small drawing. So I just want to tell you something here. And I want to sort of, polymers are very long chains. And if I actually extend the polymer chain and sort of stretch it out, it could be one micron in length. If it's, let's say, a molecular weight of about a million, it would be one micron in length if I stretch it out. On the other hand, if it just collapses like a random coil that I've indicated on the right side, its dimension is only about 0 0.03 microns. So it decreases quite substantially. So when we do a lot of uh, uh, sort of manipulating of polymeric materials, depending on the temperature, these molecules can actually change its conformation. And the molecular uh, sort of feature of these molecules become evident in a lot of properties that it exhibits. And I'll give you one example. So uh, I have written a small term there that is entropy. Entropy is the extent of disorder in a system, in a very simple sort of layman's term. And as opposed to this extended conformation, all polymer chains will naturally occur in the conformation that is present on the right, which is called a random coil conformation. And that's simply because if I hold the end of the two, uh, if, I, if you imagine it's a string and I hold the end of the string, two ends of the string at a particular distance, which is one dimension by which you measure the size of a polymer, which is called the end-to-end -end distance. If you hold it at one particular distance in, the, in this figure and ask yourself how many different shapes can this string take when the distance between the two ends are fixed at that value, you will tell me that there are infinite number of possible conformations. Conformations is a shape of that string, if you will. In a chemistry point of view, conformations are different shapes that molecules can take without a breaking a bond, but by simply rotating bonds between them. Okay, so on the, on the left conformation, for instance, if I hold the string stretched out and ask how many different shapes can that string take for that distance, you will give me an answer as one. So which means the number of possible states on the right conformation that the string can adapt for a particular size is so large, and that gives us the disorder. That means the number of configurations that can lead to that size is very large. Okay? And that's what drives macromolecules or polymers to adapt this conformation. Keep that in mind because the other very important characteristic of a polymeric material is this sort of what you call an entanglement. Okay? I've highlighted this here, which means two, is two long molecules are not necessarily connected but they're entangled. And this entanglement is something that many of you would have suffered when you have a string that is either not knotted or a bundle of strings, and you're trying to undo it. You will see that it's quite difficult, even though there is no knot or anything. These entanglements are something that, uh, that, uh, that causes pain to us when we try to unentangle a ball of strings. Now, what is interesting about these entanglements is that it gives the required mechanical properties. Even though they're not linked, these entanglements cannot be pulled apart very easily because it takes a long way to actually pull a string through this. Okay, so these entanglements give it adequate uh, strength to these materials and among other things. But what is more important is that the segments that lie, the, the segments that lie between two entangled junctions, when they are very long, those segments can exhibit mobility, especially if the temperature at which the uh, system is, is higher than what an important temperature in polymer science is called the glass transition temperature. That means it's the temperature beyond which the segments that lie between these entangled point, entanglement points has enough energy to move around. Okay, and why is that important? It is important for one property that I want to illustrate as an example of uh, of the molecular nature of polymers impacting its properties. So suppose I take a piece of plastic and I pull on it, okay, what I will end up doing or what will end up happening to the collection of molecules that are present in that is that because the polymer chain is in a random coil conformation, when you pull it, you will start stretching out the chains. That means the chains will start unwinding and begin to extend in the direction in which you are applying the shear. Okay, so it will go past, and of course, if these polymer chains are not linked, when you pull them, they will start 
occup translating, okay? They will start occupying different positions. When I say translate, their center of mass is actually moving. And once you start doing that and you let go the force that you're applying, the system will not retract. However, if you either have entanglements of crosslinks as is present in rubber, that means you tie these long strings up at certain number of points, which are called crosslinks, so that the entire bundle now doesn't have each segment has ability to change conformation, but does not have an ability to independently translate. Okay, once you prevent that independent translation, when you stretch, rubber is a really remarkable material, right? You can modify its dimension maybe 10, 20, even 100 times, and you let go and it goes back to its original dimension. There is actually no other material known to man that can actually do this kind of retraction. And it's interesting to ask the question, why does rubber retract when you let go? And it's exactly what I showed you in the last slide, that is because the segments between crosslink junctions like to go into a random coil conformation, a stretched conformation is thermodynamically unstable. In other words, that is not the preferred conformation of the chain. So when you let go, it goes back to its conformation that is thermodynamically stable. It's exactly the same reason why if I had a cylinder of gas here and I simply open the valve, gas will simply escape to occupy the entire volume available to it. And there is only one motivation for this to happen, and it's entropy. That means when the gas escapes and occupies a larger volume, the entropy of the gas is higher than when it is compressed in a cylinder. So rubber retracts exactly the same reason. That is, it has a driving motivation for retraction is actually the higher entropy of the retracted state. Now, this is a beautiful evidence of the fact that the polymer chain actually is able to do molecular motion to change its dimension. Likewise, there are many other interesting properties that happen. So one important thing to remember about plastics is that many polymers like what I've listed above, polyethylene, polypropylene, and PET, and et cetera, are what are called semi-crystalline. That means they are not only molecularly very interesting, but also macroscopically, they are not uniform. They are built up, they have regions in which the polymer chain is very well organized. They are called crystalline regions. And they have regions in which the polymer chain is actually amorphous. That means there is no order in which the polymer segments are arranged. Okay, and this, this combination of uh, crystalline and amorphous domains, the amorphous domains look like this. These are all expansions of these small regions, right? So this is a spherulite, and each of these actually are crystalline regions. And between the crystalline regions here, you have these amorphous regions. And the reason why the amorphous regions are important is when you impact any material, when you impact any polymeric material, the energy of the impact needs to be dissipated. If it is not dissipated, the material will break. Okay, the material will break. So the way you, uh, the impact of, uh, of the energy of the impact is dissipated is by these amorphous regions in the polymer actually begin to wiggle and jiggle. That means it becomes a little warmer. So, you know, temperature is actually, in, in, in many ways, increase in temperature is simply is, a, uh, is reflected by a larger amount of motion of molecules. In this case, motion of segments. So it acts as a shock absorber. That means the energy of impact gets dissipated in the amorphous regions by moving of these chains. And this will happen provided the uh, temperature of the uh, glass transition uh, provided the glass transition temperature is low, that means at the temperature at which you're giving the impact should be higher than the glass transition temperature of the polymer. So, so yeah, this is an example of a crystalline polymer. This is uncooked spaghetti. So in fact, that's exactly what you would imagine. And once you cook it, you have these very soft, flexible uh, 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 strings which are entangled. So in some sense, you might think of an amorphous uh, domain of a polymer looking like cooked uh, spaghetti and uh, the crystalline regions look like the uncooked one that I showed you here. Well organized, no entanglement, chains are strong, and once you cook them, they go into this very interesting uh, uh, amorphous state. Now, I will come to the uh, one aspect that bothers all of us, and that is the The total amount of plastic that we produce, 
this is a distribution of different countries and the amount of plastics that we produce. You will very see, you will see that the amount of plastics that we produce has steadily increased and the rapid rise from 2009 onwards is a steady increase in the number of uh, uh, million tons of plastics that we produce. <coughs> and this is a ge geographic distribution of various countries that produces. This is the North American continent, Europe and China. So you can see that the amount of plastic produced by just these three countries are actually more than almost three-fourths of the total plastic that we produce. And I'll come back to the utilization in the next slide. But you will see from here that a very large fraction of the plastics that are used is actually in packaging. And that's exactly a big concern for us, right? So almost 40% of the total plastic that we produce goes into packaging material. <clears throat> so this is a very interesting sort of uh, uh, data. Here, what they have estimated is, as of 2015, what is the total cumulative amount of plastic that we have produced? Cumulative means the sum total of all the polymeric uh, materials that we have produced since the time polymers were actually manufactured. And that is about 8.3 billion tons, okay, 8,300 million tons, of which 6.3 billion tons, million, uh, 6.3 billion tons has already become waste. So that's a huge amount of waste that we've already generated. So anything that we do further is only going to mitigate waste that we're going to generate from now on. But this 8.3, uh, 6.3 million tons has already become waste, and only 9% was actually recycled. So you can see how, um, how the humans have been so, I would say, uh, you know, surprisingly uh, stupid for not having recognized the importance of actually having recycled earlier. So we are now stuck with 6.3 billion tons or more because this is 2015, and we are still recycling probably only about 10% of the total plastic that we produce worldwide. So now I'm just giving you a few structures of poly poly polymers, common polymers, not to bore you with this, but just to highlight three points. One is the ones that are highlighted, if you will notice, they are all, this is a notation that chemists very often use, but all the backbone atoms are carbon, okay, in all the ones that I've highlighted, that is uh, uh, polyethylene, polystyrene, polypropylene, polyvinyl chloride. This actually occupies majority of the polymers. The rest of them, all of them have a heteroatom. This has a nitrogen in the backbone. This is nylon. This is an ester. This has a, this is what I showed you as an oxygen in the backbone. And likewise, okay, so all of these that have heteroatoms in the backbone are in principle degradable. That means living systems have the necessary machinery to cleave them into small bits. But that's not enough because what I told you earlier, you can see that because these plastics are semi-crystalline, and the crystalline regions are impenetrable to enzymes or even living systems. And therefore, despite polyethylene tetrahydrate, this bottle being biodegradable in principle, chemical constitution-wise, because of the nature in which the molecules are organized in this, access to the crystalline domains are very hard to do. And the amorphous content is very small in PET. So typically, PET is about 70% crystalline. That means the total amount of change, 70% of it, is in a crystalline domain and overly a 30% is in amorphous domain. So accessing the amorphous domains by microbes or enzymes is very difficult and therefore despite chemically being degradable, physically it impedes degradation. Okay, so that's one of the big problems with this. So uh, unless you are able to make it completely amorphous, transform it completely amorphous, you will not be able to degrade it. Okay, so that was one point I wanted to make here. Um, now, usage-wise, this is what I told you. So the types of plastics that are produced, you can see here that 19% polypropylene, 18% HDPE, another kind of polyethylene, LD, low density polyethylene, which is what we use for our milk bags, 12% high density polyethylene, which used for bottles and many other things. PVC is 10%. So if you sum total from PVC all the way to PP, you will see that it is probably around 60% belongs to the class of polymers that are fully carbon, okay? And the rest of them are actually in principle degradable, but all the carbon ones are unfortunately not biodegradable at all. Uh, so it's clear that the remarkable convenience that humans have experienced over the last several decades of utilizing plastics 
has led to this incredible short night as short sightedness that has brought us to the brink that we are currently in. So, um, the question is that these are some of the reasons why it has become so indispensable. They are easy to process, uh, formability, molded. You can make all these lovely colors, lovely um, uh, patterns, shapes, and everything. So, they are very easily formable and they are both aesthetically pleasing and convenient. Uh, and convenient. So, I was talking to some of the students who were asking me questions in the, uh, before the talk. And what is good about plastics? When you look at the other alternative uh, materials that we can use, we have metals and we have ceramic. Okay? When you compare these two, you can very clearly look at the, uh, the value of this. For, for instance, this is I think 500 ml, so it weighs about 500 grams. And if I ask you what the weight of the bottle is in this, it would probably be around 50 grams. Okay? So, a very small fraction of the weight of what you are carrying is the container itself. Suppose I were to do this with glass, okay, the container weight will be equal or probably exceed that of the water that you are carrying in it. Okay? And so, one important thing is that it has led to an environmental positive is the fact that because of its light weight, the transportation cost or transportation, uh, the outcome of transporting materials that are heavy is that you require more fuel to transport them and if you use more fuel, you will generate more carbon dioxide. So clearly, using plastics has reduced the amount of carbon dioxide that we have generated and released into the air. So lighter vehicles such as cars, airplanes, when you replace metal parts with plastics, it reduces the weight, improves the fuel efficiency, which means again the amount of carbon dioxide that you will release as a result of using them would go down. So clearly, um, that is one big positive that the light weight of plastics has a strong environmental positive. The second thing is the temperature at which typically plastics are processed. That means plastics are processed exactly like you make uh, a wax candle. So how do you make a wax candle? You take wax, melt it and pour it into a mold and then you take out the candle. So every plastic item that you use is typically melted. Okay? Most plastics are melted, poured into suitable shaped containers and productized. So some of these are blown, so it's, not, it's a slightly different process, but the idea is to take it to a molten state, allow it to flow into whatever mold you want. The temperature at which these things typically happen all polyethylene, polypropylene, etc., are less than 200 degrees, while this is processed at maybe 270 PET. But compare that with metal. Metals are processed to form metals. You need to use temperatures of over 1,000 degrees. Likewise, glass and ceramics greater than 600 degrees, which means you have to heat these materials to those temperatures, and heating it consumes energy, right? So evidently, processing other materials is more energy expensive than processing plastic. So for these two reasons, because energy is at the core of our, uh, of our uh, uh, connectedness in terms of climate change, you will immediately agree that plastics have these two very important uh, uh, plus points that, uh, that you've seen. Now, what are the negatives? The bad, okay, the many. One of the most important things that concern us is the resource itself. I told you that Resource utilization is connected to our sustainable lifestyle, right? So, almost all the plastics that I listed out, uh, the resource, the starting material that we have is mined. That means it's petroleum, which we take from uh, below the ground. And petroleum takes a large number of years to form. Okay? It's a very slow process of converting uh, matter into petroleum, organic matter into petroleum. Uh, however, the amount of uh, the fraction of petroleum that we draw from the earth that we utilize for manufacturing plastics or even other chemicals in general is a small one. Majority of the petroleum that we extract goes into transportation, energy, okay, energy and transportation. So it's only a small fraction of it, despite the fact uh, I have to agree that the source itself is not renewable. So that's one concern we have. That means we can't continue to use this as the source and expect to have a sustainable uh, uh, source. The second one is, of course, pollution, which is something that all of you are aware of. It pollutes uh, 
air, water, and soil. About 15 years ago, if I had given a talk, I would often have said both polyethylene and polypropylene are actually non-toxic. They have no reason to be toxic. They are pure hydrocarbons, and the human body has no mechanism to digest it. Okay, so if I eat polyethylene, I will simply discard it. Okay, I have no mechanism, the body has no mechanism to digest it. So it's actually non-toxic. Polyethylene and polypropylene are non-toxic. However, what has come to light more recently is the fact that there's a lot of very, very tiny particles of plastic okay, that gets into the air, gets into the water system by variety of methods. Okay? So for instance, um, just running the car on the road, you know, you see that there is a wear and tear of the tires of cars, right? After some time, you see the tread, uh, treads are gone. Now, where is it gone? The question is, what happens to those abraded pieces of rubber? You know, when you run your car on the road, you're, you need friction to be able to run it. But friction also causes abrasion of the plastic. Okay, so mechanical abrasion of the plastic leads to generation of very, very fine particles. And those particles can be uh, thrown up into the air depending on the size. And so we end up breathing it along with dust and everything else. We are actually ingesting small amounts of very, very tiny particles when we are on the road. Likewise, it is known that even just washing the fabric in the, in the washing machine generates very tiny microfibrils, especially if you have synthetic material, those microfibrils can get into the water stream. So there are many ways, and of course in the sea, gradually degradation causes plastics to break up into smaller and smaller pieces and eventually get into various kinds of cycles, food cycles and so on. So that is something that's become very important and the reason why it is toxic is not fully understood. It need not be chemically toxic. That means the chemical constituents of the microparticles need not necessarily be toxic, but just that when they get really tiny, they can get into the cells. And once they are into the cell, they are looked at by the cell as some, some foreign object that has invaded in the cell, like everything else. And so those tiny particles, when they become comparable to that of microbes and so on, are, are seen as potential enemies uh, to life itself. And so that is the kind of response that the cell has to these things. It's not necessarily a, a sort of chemically toxic material. So, and there are many reasons to believe that if you have lots of plastic in the soil, it grows, it slows down the rate of growth of, uh, of uh, the plants. Um, how am I doing on time? About five more minutes. Okay, good. So I'll, I'll finish quickly then. So we all agree that what should degrade? I mean, we don't want our buckets to degrade, right? So we want primarily, when you think about degradable versus non-degradable materials, the materials that you want to design to degrade are the ones that you want to dispose or discard, like the ones that I've listed there, okay? So the rest of them you don't want. No, so molecular criteria I already mentioned to you, the top three polymers, which are all basically carbon backbones, will not degrade, but the ones on the bottom will degrade. So there's a lot of drive now to replace the existing packaging materials with those that are likely to degrade. Unfortunately, the properties of these materials that are there on the green are not good enough to actually cause this repla uh, replacement to be completely effective, except polyethylene tetraphthalate. Okay, so here I will skip. This is something I mentioned already. So these are some of the modes in which uh, degradation, environmental degradation of plastics can happen. And I think it's important to remember that when we call something biodegradable, when it's fully biodegradable, the products of degradation of the plastic finally should be completely benign, which means it should be either water, carbon dioxide, methane, and other kinds of molecules that are naturally present in the, in the environment. Okay, it cannot be anything other than that. And most plastics don't degrade completely into these. So I will, so the problem is that there is this uh, sort of debate between recycling and degradation. So what do we do? It's very clear that for certain kinds of applications, degradation is important, like the ones that we want to be indisciplined and discard, they should degrade. And the ones that you can collect, like the pet bottles, in India, the good news is we recycle almost 70% of the pet bottles. It is quite remarkable compared to the rest of the world, okay, because we already have a system of collection and segregation. So, uh, so you can mechanically reprocess, you can melt and reprocess 
but unfortunately most of the time you remelt any product and reprocess it deteriorates in quality okay because there is chain session so one of the ways in which plastic pollution happens we don't use it very much in india but these are used a lot in uh, in temperate climate in colder climates to basically preserve water and also keep the temperature of the soil not very low okay and that causes gradual degradation so in principle the the degradation i mean the recycling from a linear to a circular plastic economy with in other words a circular economy is to put everything in a loop as long as i use it get back and it goes back into the feed that means it becomes a resource for manufacturing the next product then i'm putting it on a circular economy and if i can do that with most of the plastics i can actually solve the problem that means i need to collect all the plastics and redo it if you go to the old days glass used to be always even today glass is almost fully recycled that means you go back and you use the used glass along with fresh uh, glass to make the bottles okay so that's exactly what you're doing so one stage is mechanical recycling that means you melt the polymer you take this remelt it and reprocess it into a bottle the other is chemical recycling that means you degrade this back to the starting materials from which it was made and you reconstruct it if you do chemical recycling the product quality would be as good as new of course it is much more energy intensive and therefore it's not the preferred choice today so mechanical recycling is the preferred choice today and the last one is of course to recover energy from these if you think about it i mentioned to you that polyethylene and polypropylene are both pure hydrocarbons so the calorific value of polyethylene and polypropylene per unit mass is the same that as that of petrol okay there's no difference in calorific value so you can look at all these polyethylene and polypropylene as borrowed energy that means you use this for some time and once you use it you can generate energy from it unfortunately that method today would not be a method of choice for for reasons that we would uh, be causing effect on our climate there are many interesting studies that have been done i'm just going to highlight two before i close and that is how do i take polyethylene and convert it to a fuel okay and this is a very interesting paper that appeared a few years ago where they take it and they are able to convert it to diesel effectively that means polyethylene and polypropylene can be converted to diesel and utilized as fuel for running our automobiles so here is an example that's what i told you last couple of slides that means i can take a polymer and recycle it but each time i recycle because the polymer chain will break into smaller pieces the properties actually deteriorate and what i've shown you just is that the young's modulus goes down quite a bit that tells you the stiffness of the material and that's an important property that you're looking at so um uh, this is something else i would skip but i will st stop before i stop i want to talk about one of my colleagues at iisc who has actually been working in the area of plastic recycling or you might say upcycling so he's working with a company called manjushri uh, packaging trying to develop chemistry that will allow him to or and processing techniques that will allow him to retain the property of the polymer upon recycling and what he has been able to show is in the material science engineering his photograph is there surjo bose and what he has been able to show is that when you recycle it multiple times unlike what you see here the property de deterioration happens very rapidly but by doing some clever chemistry and adding additives he is able to retain the quality after several reruns almost at the same with much smaller deterioration of the property so in other words uh, uh methodology is clever methodology is to ensure that the property doesn't deteriorate as much uh, up upon recycling is going to be an important area where research uh, must happen so i would like to stop here with a one comment and that is <clears throat> we know many solutions are there okay there are solutions that are accessible to us some of that are some of that is hard to implement because of the economic uh economic costs of it that is easier to handle what one needs to do is to add the cost of recycling at the point at which you sell the item okay so that the product becomes a little more expensive the the person will take responsibility for the recycling of the product that is less of a concern because we know that recycling all processes of recycling will require energy okay and so the energy input into recycling is something that will affect the climate okay so that's going to be one important challenge that we need to worry so i'll end with this this is something that i already said but because there was a student who asked me the question what is actually the interesting solution to these problems this interconnected problems that you are faced with 
I would leave you with this slide and let you think. Okay, so this is a log uh, log cabin built out of purely, completely sustainable material generated with no input of energy from us. Okay, the input of energy to generate the log comes from the sun. So photosynthesis is what is converting carbon dioxide to material. All the biomass that we generate is the is a result of photosynthesis. And of course, the person on the right is using her own energy to carry out work that is essential. Today, we use only washing machines largely, but this is a chore that she does using her own energy, which is zero pollution. So an interesting question is, can if you want to be in a fully sustainable sort of cycle, you have to imagine a scenario where you go back to this, and this is an impossibility for us today. So we have to innovate and think about other ways to go. Uh, with that, I'd like to close. I'm, I'm seeing that my moderator is already here. I apologize for having taken a couple of minutes more. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for this. <clears throat> we have time for a couple of questions. Actually, there are, there are a lot of questions which were posed earlier on in the talk, and I think they were already answered a little later in the talk. So I will just briefly run through them. If you have some comment on them, you can make it. Otherwise, I, I mean, many of them are answered. So there's a question about uh, will plastic decay or will it stay forever? Does repurposing plastic for uh, products like brooms, fabric, and roads, does it contribute to environment sustainability better or worse than traditional methods? Or does it accelerate the generation of microplastics? Uh, th there are statements about certain plastics that can be digested by mealworms. Is this correct? Are there other biological ways? So these are questions by Aditya Verma, Arun Justi Maria Justin, Sai Arun Prasad. The, okay. To some extent, so, they have yeah. been. Yeah. So here's a different question. Sanjay asks, how promising is the field of extracting monomers and polymers directly from plants? Being biodegradable, is this a viable replacement solution to petrochemical-based plastics? Yes, indeed. There's a lot of, uh, that's an important question, and there's a lot of research that is happening today. Polylactic acid, polylactide, for instance, I didn't have time. Polylactide is a, a polymer that is uh, completely generated from biosource. Lactic acid is uh, gotten from sugar uh, fermentation, so you can get lactic acid from sugar and polylactide will be fully de biodegradable. So there are many examples of that, that you can get from bio and go back. But the question is on scale. You know, the hard problem is that the amount of plastics that we use today is so large that to be able to generate this from biomass is actually very difficult in today's context. That's the big challenge. So you can't replace everything, but you can replace a, a reasonable number of things that we want to discard carelessly and continue to live our lifestyle the way we want to. We can discard some of them, and a lot of effort is happening in that area to replace it from biosource. The only problem is that the strength of polylactide, for instance, as of today, the mechanical properties is not good enough when compared to polyethylene or polypropylene. So a lot of work going on to try and improve that. And with regard to the lot of other questions that came through, uh, hydrocarbons are largely not broken and it takes a long time. But there's some good, good news if you stress microbes and you don't feed them anything else other than hydrocarbon, they apparently learn to deal with it okay, in, in over generations. Because their lifetime is so small, they can evolve in the lifetime of humans. So I was reading an article that says that if you for generations together you stress uh, microbes, they will learn to deal with hydrocarbons. And we may stress them and make them do our work, who knows, yeah. Okay. Thank you. There, there are more questions, but maybe in the interest of Sure, time, we will we take will it take, during tea. Perhaps we will take them during the break, and also later on there will be one more round of q Absolutely. So please join me in thanking uh, Ramakrishnan once again.